Yeah, there's a story behind that, obviously. Um, no, so Mr. Uh, Mr. Matthew Graber um, exported me while I was on vacation drinking with money. And without going into too much detail, I now have an $80 North Korean, North Korean romper, so thank you, Matt. So the goal here is tonight at the bar to wear it and get $80 worth of alcohol, so... Which, can we see it? Yeah, so, yeah, we'll go ahead and... <laughs> so since... <laughs> so you will see me wearing that after the talk down at the bar, um, unfortunately. <laughs> it's really detailed. You can see his pores and everything, which is... <laughs> Yeah. As long as we can't see yours. Yeah. So the original plan was to just wear it five minutes during the conference, and then Kennedy uh, kind of screwed me by announcing it during the opening opening ceremony that I had this romper. So um, I will be wearing it tonight um, for more than five minutes. So. All right. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Awesome. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Matt. Um, I'm a security researcher and red teamer at Specter Ops. Uh, when you work with a bunch of trolls, this is the kind of crap that gets created. Um, yeah, so like I said, um, I'm a trainer as well. So um, we give a red team training. As, um, you know, I've, I've taught a black cat the last few years. Um, speaker, um, calm lover, researcher, etc. Nothing too crazy. So the short vo version of what I'm going to be talking about today is going to be um, kind of an overview of UAC and the history of it, um, going back from its very first birth to, to now and, and how it's evolved or how um, you know bypasses have evolved. So we're going to start talking a little bit about what UAC is, how the integrity level model works, um, and we're going to go into kind of the research methodology. So Graber, Matt Graber has, has done a great job of inspiring me to kind of talk more about my thought process instead of just showing kind of the cool stuff that I've found, right? So we're going to walk through some of the, the methodology for, um, you know, one specific bypass. Obviously, methodology changes around different stuff that you're researching. So we'll kind of cover that. And then we're going to go into how the, uh, you know, various bypasses have evolved over the last few years. And then um, mitigations, which there's literally one. We'll talk about at the end. And then obviously demos throughout. So UAC, um, what is it? Stands for user account control. Um, so in the words of a Microsoft blog post is that it's meant to enable users to run with standard user, user rights as opposed to being an administrator. So the idea behind it was a standard user can still elevate without actually running as a local administrator. I'm sure all of you in here know that um, that is not the case. Um, in most environments. So when a user logs into a workstation um, and they're a local administrator, Windows will give them uh, two tokens to that particular logon session. Um, this is commonly referred to as a split token admin. So they get a standard token, and then when a user elevates, they get um, an elevated token, which, which UAC kind of handles the, the brokering between that. And if you're not a shoulder, if you're not a local administrator, um, UAC offers over the shoulder elevation. And that's when you right click and run as administrator. And if you're not a local admin, um, UAC will prop up and say enter the credentials of a user that has the privilege you're requesting, right? So we're going to be focusing on the split token admin scenario. There are attack vectors um, around over the shoulder elevation, um, which James Forshaw actually outlined a little bit in some of his recent blog posts. So we're not going to go in depth on that. We're going to stick to the split token admin scenario. So who cares, right? So yeah, if you're if you land on a box, the user's a local admin, um, like, why does it matter? Uh, every, every, it's very easy to, to defeat or, or remove this kind of vector. It's don't put your user in the local administrators group. For whatever reason, that's a concept that's really hard for most organizations to grasp. Um, so I, I have never been on an engagement where I haven't seen most users um, removed from the local administrator group. So. We have always had to, to get around this feature in Windows. Um, so it, it's going to be there. It's been there. It's going to be there. It will forever be there until people actually start to, um, you know, do what they need to be doing, which we'll cover here in a little bit. 
And then there's the delicate, um, the delicate concept of security boundaries, um, which I was totally prepared for somebody to throw a rock at me when I said that. Um, attackers don't care about them. I'll, I'll, in the next two or three slides, I'll kind of go over a little bit of what, what a boundary is, which there's no, there's no actual definition for it. So I'll go over what my, um, you know, derived definition is from some of the sources at Microsoft. So from the famous words of Jessica Payne at Microsoft's Ignite conference in New Zealand, um, attackers don't care about security boundaries. So what is a security boundary? Mark Osinovich did a post in 2007 on UAC um, specifically, and this is the best definition I could get from somebody that's actually at Microsoft, right? So technically, um, you know, there's no actual definition of this. Um, Mark calls it a, a wall through which code and data can't pass without authorization of a security policy. Now, it's a very gray area, right? So some might say, well, UAC is a security policy. It's pre to prevent, you know, users from elevating or users from doing administrative rights without explicitly allowing it. Uh, so there's a, there's a gray area. Um, I don't think it's a, it's a boundary yet whatsoever. Um, this is also a presentation that Mark gave in 2007, I believe. Um, and this is where he, at the very bottom, he explicitly states that elevation is not a security boundary. So that's why that these bypasses are never serviced. Um, Microsoft for the longest time didn't really give uh, two crops about it, um, which is why it just kind of ran rampant for a while. Um, we'll cover uh, towards the end how things have changed, both from the attacker perspective as well as uh, Microsoft's perspective. Um, so before we get too deep into that, we're going to go over UAC on the integrity level. Um, I'm not going to go super crazy in depth because I'd be here for a really long time. But basically, um, you are in, you are assigned an integrity level um, to your security access token, and that's kind of defined by SID, and that that grants that determines what kind of access that your user that your user is going to have. So, as a normal standard user, you're not able to delete files out of System 32, right? When you elevate up to a high integrity, um, you know, context, you're then able to do these administrative actions. So, the security reference monitor will compare the, the users and group SIDs. Um, and that security access token to the, the actual ACL and the object that you're trying to manipulate and determine, um, you know, are you able to perform that action or not. It gets much more in the weeds than that. That's kind of the, the top level overview that I kind of put together that might not confuse a bunch of people. Um, there's a lot of really good documentation out there on, um, you know, the entirely like the security architecture as far as, as elevation and, and integrity goes. So integrity levels, there are kind of four-ish to five levels. Um, typically, as attackers, we only care about, um, you know, being in that high integrity level. So high integrity is going to, um, you know, give us the ability to make the changes that we need, um, that be open handles to processes like LSAS, um, deleting files, et cetera. Users are placed in medium integrity by default, um, and then you've got low integrity, which is very restricted, and then you've got system. So kind of where the gap comes in between as far as getting uh, UAC and getting around it is going to be between the medium and the high. So your normal user is going to be medium, and then your goal is going to be to achieve, um, you know, higher, higher. So like I said, when we're researching UAC, um, we're more interested in um, obviously just the, the high integrity and medium integrity security access tokens. Again, high integrity equals administrator, medium integrity is going to be the normal user context. So there are various UAC levels. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are, are pretty familiar with them, right? So you've got always notify, which um, to most people, for whatever reason, means that like they're completely okay and that their user is fine being in the local administrator group if this is set. Um, you've got... Um, just notify with secure desktop and notify with secure, or with no secure desktop and then never notify. So the default is going to be notify, that middle one there. All the way at the top is always notify, and then all the way at the bottom is never, or like don't ever notify. Um, again, default is, is notify. So. Users, a user is a local administrator. An attacker lands on that host. That user is sitting in a medium integrity context. UAC is set to the default level. So an attacker has to somehow find a way to jump up an integrity level so that they can actually, um, you know, do what they need to do as far as, you know, dumping cred, stuff like that. Um, so the next component here is kind of the bypass research. So what are attackers doing? Um, what are researchers doing to, to get around, um, you know, this feature? 
One thing I will note is that um, it's a required thing to get around for attackers, right? So um, when a an attacker has an objective, like that's why they're in, they're in your organization, um, UAC is just going to be a, a small little barrier that they have to overcome. And this is this talk is more of a, a tradecraft focused talk. There are no vulnerabilities. There are no exploitation. There's no exploitation going on. Um, it's just highlighting the high level high level overview of what attackers are doing to circumvent this in order to keep moving along their chain. So ideally, a user would like to, or an attacker would like to do this elevation without alerting the user. So if an attacker alerts a user during elevation process, it's going to tip the user off. They might say something. It's it's risky for them, right? So the ideal situation is going to be to to elevate silently. One thing that I've been seeing kind of a lot of is these GUI bypasses. Um, if you're if you're interactively logged onto a workstation and you're able to click on things, um, there's no there's no bypass, you know, there, right? So don't be this guy. Don't don't open the don't be yeah yeah. Don't open the task manager. Right click, run as new task, set it to run as administrator and shells, right? At that point, you can just click yes on the, the approval prompt. There's no real, there's no real potential there. So I just want to set the scene for that is, um, elevating up is going to be something that an attacker has to do silently. And if they can interactively log into a host, um, you know, being quiet, it's relatively out the window there. They could just click on yes. So, so elevation objects for the, for the last, uh, as long as it's probably way before I was even born, um, That's for you guys. <laughs> finding finding bypasses typically involves finding some sort of object that elevates um, silently, and then abusing that object to get your own code to run. Um, so in Windows, there are a bunch of processes that um, they're set to auto elevate silently, and this this is really only applies to that that default UAC setting, right? So. Um, <laughs> The idea here is to enumerate these these processes. They can be scheduled tasks. They could be processes. So Windows will have a each executable um, typically will have a manifest in it. That manifest will determine, hey, is this Microsoft signed binary that's running out of a system protected location like System 32? Um, is it set to auto elevate? If it's true, anytime that the executable is ran, it will elevate up to high integrity without um, you know requiring the user to to allow it. Um, so some common ones are like Event Viewer. Um, task manager, stuff like that. So once you identify these various components that allow you to elevate silently, you're going to want to abuse those in some manner. That being, um, you know, registry keys, file rights. Um, there's a lot of really, really derpy stuff that we'll go over in this presentation as far as that goes. So when looking at the manifest, you can do this with SigCheck tac -M. Um, you can see here that the manifest for eventviewer.exe has the um, requested execution level as highest available. Then the auto elevate property is set to true. So what that's saying is when UAC is in its default state, when any time that a user runs in, it runs um, eventviewer.exe, it's going to silently elevate and display the event viewer for the user without requiring the user to click yes on the prompt. Pretty straightforward. So the idea or the methodology behind that is to identify these processes be, and then identify, you know, what are they doing when they're, when they're ran. So a good, a good program to do that with is Process Monitor. So this allows you to see, um, you know, what, for the most part, what all a process is doing as far as registry reads, file writes, file queries, registry queries, stuff like that. So this is just one example um, for SDCLT, which is one that I've logged about. When a, when a, um, a uh, binary elevates and it's reading from the registry. Um, in most cases, it will read from the current user hive. So that's kind of taking or it's abusing the primitive of a process that's elevated up silently is reading or pulling information from a, a location that you as a, as a normal user who's not elevated can tamper with, right? So in this case, it's pulling this um, isolated command, I think. Nope, app paths. Sorry, wrong one. That was a different one with this binary. Um, so app paths is just saying, SDLC, when it starts, um, what am I doing? I need to start control.exe to open up a control panel item, right? So when this happens, it says, okay, I need to find the application path for control, for the control panel, control.exe. It's looking in the user hive. So you can hijack that and say, 
cmd.exe is now control.exe. So when you're when the program that's elevated up um, is looking for the app path of, of the program it needs, it's going to say, um, you know, I need this. It's going to look in the registry. Um, once you change that, it's going to just it's going to take whatever you give it, right? So instead of the legitimate value, um, it's going to start whatever you put there. Um, so that's just kind of a, a primitive. So finding these via process monitor, um, the way that you can do that is just filter down to events um, as name not found, and then filter that down to um, you know any any queries happening in the in HKCU or the current user's hive, and that will give you a pretty good idea of of what all that that particular process is doing um, as an elevated in an elevated context to a location that you know um, as an attacker you can control. So like I said, after you've identified these particular objects, the next step would be to abuse them. That would be doing a registry write to that location, putting your payload in. Um, again, bypasses are, are variant in the sense that uh, there are many objects you can abuse. Um, there are many things you can do to abuse these objects. So registry key additions are kind of the new thing. Um, you've got event variable manipulation, um, which James Forshaw did a good post on recently. And then uh, race conditions, which is kind of a fun one that, that me and Matt Graber worked on. So this is just an example of abusing that same one that we looked at in Procmon, right? So it's querying the user hive for the app path for control.exe. We've replaced that with cmd.exe, and then we started that binary. And since that binary, when it starts, it's saying, okay, my next job is to pull from the registry. I need to start control.exe. Sees cmd.exe there, and it just uses that. And here you can see here that um, we are actually running as an administrator here. So that's kind of the, the generic overview. Um, that is kind of a, a methodology for the registry manipulation portion of it. There are hundreds of other primitives as far as this goes, um, which is why it's not something that can be easily fixed. It's not something that will be fixed. Um, the fix is to not be dumb and pull your account out of the local administrator group. So bypass evolution. I started developing this deck, and I was like, I'm going to go from, like, I'm going to do a, an entire history talk on, on UAC bypasses. And I started looking, and I was like, this deck's going to be, like, 420 slides by the time I'm done. And um, I don't want to piss anyone off as far as credit goes. So I'm going to go over just some generic ones. This isn't going to cover all of them. Um, this is going to cover some of the more prominent ones that have been used in the wild, at least from what I've seen and heard. Um, if you're looking for some sort of like definitive list of, of public bypasses that are out there. Um, H Firefox has a really good um, GitHub um, repository of, of all of these documented bypasses, if they've been fixed, what, win what versions of Windows do they work on, and he's got a POC binary that implements every single one of them. And you can just run it and give it a technique and it will execute it for you. Um, so kind of a cool little thing as far as playing around with. Um, it's the only source that really accurately and, um, you know, maintains a, a, com a comprehensive list of these. So definitely go check that out. Like I said, not covering every bypass technique. Um, I'm going to cover just kind of the tradecraft around some of the, the newer bypasses. And, and from an operational security standpoint that attackers are facing, how these various bypasses might you know, be safer or more noisier than, than others. So the first one's the good old iFile operation. So this is the one that's been around since 2009. It's been the default one um, in almost every malware sample that, that has some sort of module to get around UAC. Created by Leo Davidson, again, back in 2009. Um, it still works on the vast majority of endpoints. So Microsoft actually fixed this in Windows 10 RS2 and build 15007. Um, which we'll cover why they fix that. And like I said, it's not a boundary, so why are they fixing it? I'll kind of uh, explain that here, here in a little bit. So the way that this works is that iFile operation is a, a com component that allows you, it has a method called copy item. And what that does, it allows you to copy an item from one location to another. Straightforward, right? The caveat to this is that um, technically, in order to invoke this specific app or object and then call that method is you have to be running inside a Microsoft signed, um, you know, certain whitelisted binaries. So a common one's explorer.exe. Um, so the way that this attack actually works and the way that he released it was that it injects or it spawns a new process or injects into an existing one, a, a DLL or reflective DLL that exposes this interface and this method. 
And this object is one in particular. So like I said, there are, there are many different primitives as far as things that auto-elevate. Various comp components are one of them. So there are comp objects in Windows that are permitted to elevate silently. This being one of them, given the certain um, circumstances that are required or met. One being, um, you know, that it's living in, in a process that it's expected to. So you've got a primitive right now of a privilege, this is what I call privilege file copy. So you can copy one file to a protected location silently, which is good, right? So, so far this technique invol involves, um, you know, potentially starting a new process, injecting something into another process, which can be always very risky. And then you've got to actually do your file copy, which is going to involve dropping your payload, which is going, in most cases, going to be a DLL. Drop that to disk someplace that you can write to without being elevated. Call copy item, take that, that new, that, that DLL that you dropped and copy it to a privileged location. So you might be thinking, how might you, how might you get codecs through that? How are you going to get your code running in an, el an elevated context if all you can do is copy a file? Normally, how many of you guys have, how many of you defenders have rules to see if a DLL called crypt-based.dll is dropped in C Windows System 32 sysprep? That makes me sad, no hands. Okay. I, I got me caught a lot of times. So the way that this works is attackers are lazy, they don't modify code. Is it sysprep.exe is a, an auto-elevating binary that elevates up silently without alerting the user in the default UAC setting. Um, and it looks for a DLL in its current, current directory called cryptbase.dll. Uh, that DLL doesn't exist in Windows, it will probably never exist in Windows, and it never has existed in Windows. Uh, meaning that you can use that privileged file copy to copy a malicious DLL from a location you can via an, an auto-elevating com component, copy that file over to sysprep, the sysprep folder, call it cryptbase.dll, and when you start sysprep.exe, it's going to silently elevate, and it's going to eat your DLL and load your code. Um, so this is a, hopefully everybody can see that. So FuzzySec released a cool little framework for, for automating some of this. Um, so this is just what it looks like. Um, I have a link towards the end of the presentation that contains some references as far as this goes. He just ported, you know, utilizing the iFile operation um, you know, com component in PowerShell. I'm using some really cool PE masquerading um, work. So what this does, is it, again, it just copies it towards the bottom. You can see that it's dropping the proxy DLL. Then it's doing the privilege co file copy, dropping that into sysprep, calling cryptbase.dll, and starting sysprep. So from a forensic standpoint, you're going to see a file being dropped. You're going to see um, a file being copied to a protected location, which that's not normally going to be a thing, right? Um, you're going to see that, and then you're going to see sysprep.exe start, eating a DLL that it has never consumed before, or that has never existed. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a defender, so I, I don't know definitively, but I can't imagine sysprep.exe starting in your environment would be a totally normal thing. Um, but this is still a, like, the go-to method for damn near every single adversary that has UAC bypass modules. This has been the de facto technique for, um, you know, since 2009. I got a little tired of it, um, and so that kind of what stemmed some of the research in the last, um, you know, few months particularly. So another finder called Vazi um, used the same primitive of a privileged file copy in a different way. So he removed the need to, um, to you know, do injection. So there's a built-in utility in Windows 7 and Windows 10 um, called WUS, WUSA. So it's the Windows Update standalone installer. Um, typically it's used for, you know, extraction and stuff for as far as, um, you know, installation or update files goes. This is also an auto-elevating binary. So in its manifest it says that it is permitted to, to auto-elevate without the user's approval, given that it's sitting in a, a system-protected path, so System32 or wherever it might, may reside. They removed the extract flag out of Windows 10. Reason being is that you could do a privileged file copy with this. You could cap up your payload, throw it in temp, and then call WUSA to extract that cab to a location in System32. So you're using the fact that this, this binary is automatically elevating, and then you're using that to extract your payload into a, a protected location um, that you might not normally be able to write to. So that gives you another file copy primitive, right? This is an example. So again, um, 
this is something that I, that I ported with um, obviously Vazi's you know original POC written in VB script. So you're calving a manifest. Um, the way that this kind of abuses, um, you know, you might say you've got a privileged file copy, but what do you do, right? So dropping a DLL might not. It's eh. Sysprep's also eh. Um, let me pause this guy or not. That's fine too. So the way that this works is that it actually cabs up a manifest file and then it copies that to C windows. And this manifest file, we talked about manifest files and how they, when they're embedded in a binary, they, if they're running out of, you know, C windows, C windows system 32 and they've got auto elevate set to true, they're going to be allowed to elevate up, right, silently. Um, the bug here is that W script slash C script does not have an embedded manifest. Meaning that when a binary doesn't have an embedded manifest and then you drop one in that current binary's directory and you start it, it's going to say, hey, I don't have an embedded manifest, it's going to eat the one that you provided. So how this actually works is that we're cabbing up a manifest for W, or for w script. That manifest is going to say, hey, I'm, I'm allowed to elevate. It's going to have auto elevate set to true. We're going to cab that up. We're going to extract it using our privilege file copy with WUSA. Once that is done, um, we have planted this manifest in C windows. We're copying W script from, um, you know, C windows system 32 over to C windows and we're starting it. So when W script starts, it's going to say, Hey, per my manifest and my other requirements of me running in a protected directory, I'm able to silently elevate without, you know, popping a, a UAC dialog. So now we've got the ability to start this W script.exe binary. Right, so what do you do with that to get code execution? Well, I'm sure many of you know that you can, you can run VBScript or JScript with that. Um, so this just shoves a payload in an alternate data stream, does a privilege file copy for that manifest, starts WScript, reads that, that data stream in, um, and you get codecs from there. So this is just showing here that, um, after we've executed it, that we've started cmd.exe in a high integrity context. So this is my favorite one. Uh, this kind of opened up a, a class of attacks that I don't think a lot of people publicly have talked about, um, and that's registry like verb handling modification. Um, so when a, a process starts, um, and it's typically when you double click on a process, you start a process, that's via the open verb. Uh, you can do things like when you do right click run as administrator, that's using the run as verb. So there are various verbs that are registered in Windows. There's the print verb when you right click on something and do print. Um, and that's just kind of a shortcut saying, um, you know, when this verb is invoked, go to the registry and see what do, what do I need to do here. So, the open verb is typically mapped to, um, you know, whatever invoking process. So, um, for example, eventviewer.exe has a, an open verb set to mmc.exe with the path to the event viewer msc or, or, or mmc snap-in, right? So, eventviewer.exe does not actually just start the event viewer it calls mmc.exe, which is the management console, and then passes it the path to the event viewer snap-in. The cute thing about this is that um, this is what it looks like, so it's just saying mmc.exe when an msc file is opened. Um, msc files are associated with what? mmc.exe because msc files are console files. Um, so this is just saying when an msc file is invoked, um, this is going to be what we need to do. We need to run mmc.exe and then pass it the path to that msc. This is what it looks like in, in Procmon. So you can see that we've started eventviewer.exe, which has a manifest saying, please auto elevate me because I'm special. I have auto elevate set to true and I reside in a protected directory. When that starts, event viewer says, okay, I need to start event viewer somehow. And since event viewer, I'm nervous about Kennedy coming in facing me. <laughs> When that happens, um, you know, it's going to say, okay, I need to open this MMC snap-in. This, the file format for the snap-in is our MSC, so it's going to go to the registry and say, okay, MSC files, how do I handle those? And the registry is going to say, uh, well, when you look at the shell open command value, it's going to be the MMC program, right? Perfect. So when you start a process that elevates silently, and then that invoke, or that process invokes another process, um, it, it, in most cases, inherits that that, you know, integrity level. Um, so most processes are set to, um, in their manifest, um, the, the elevation is going to be as invoker. Um, so it's going to run under the same kind of components as that invoking process. That's what's kind of happening here. So it's looking in our, in our hive, which we can control without being elevated. 
it's going to say MSC files, how do I handle those? Looks at that value and it doesn't exist, so it moves on to, you know, through the typically registry, the registry search order. It's going to move on and say, okay, now I need to look in HKCR, HKLM, I need to see what is the actual binary. We can give it that value and what actually happens is it loads it up for us. So I scripted this up, you just give it a command you want to run. This just adds the, the actual payload to the registry and that, that registry path. When eventviewer.exe starts, it's going to read that from the user hive and it's going to pull that. Um, the glory about the command, so you can see here that, that rcmd.exe is the, god dang it. <laughs> Well done, sir. Where's the romper? It's right there. I'm wearing it to the bar. All right. Yeah. You'll see it. Trust me. Yeah. I showed it to him. Thanks, man. All right. I'm. Yeah. I'm not gonna chug this, but I'll die. Oh Lord. All right. That is raunchy. All right, so, yeah, do the registry hijack, start event viewer, it's going to read that as us, and then with these specific command, or these verb handlers, you can actually give it a binary and any parameters. Um, so here we can just do like PowerShell.exe, tech ENC, and give it our payload. Um, it can be whatever you want. Here is just a PowerShell command that started cmd.exe. And then all of the really skiddy malware authors were like, this is the coolest thing since sliced bread, and now everybody uses it. Um, so John Lambert is, um, you know, he works at Microsoft leading some of their, um, you know, various malware and, and intelligence stuff. Um, he likes to constantly remind me, remind me that I'm a piece of crap for publishing code that all the bad guys are using. Um, so he likes to, to tag me in these. Um, and that actually prompted Microsoft to fix the first bypass that I've at least seen. Um, historically, they've not ever fixed a bypass, at least to my knowledge. Um, I, UAC bypasses have been around obviously longer than I've probably been alive. Uh, but this is the first one that they actually fixed. But they didn't fix it by backporting it to other versions, right? They didn't service it. They didn't CVE it. They didn't push it out in their bulletin. Um, they just added it in in a, a new build. So while they were doing the development of this new Windows build, they said, hey, we need to fix this. And they fixed it and they pushed it out. So cool, right? Their mentality is starting to shift a little bit. I think what they're starting to see is that um, it's still a thing. People still care about it, despite it not being literally useful whatsoever in Windows. Um, people still care about it. Attackers still care about it. Attackers still use it. Um, and so they, they ended up fixing this one. And that started a triage of them fixing them, um, which makes me want to keep the ones that I find private. And then James Forshaw is like, USC is stupid. And then he put out a three part blog post that more or less kills the entire technology for the end of time which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, so this is a fun one. So like I said, we've got various uh, primitives, right? So we just did some privileged file copy ones. Um, this one is a race condition, which is a rather unique one. Um, and part of me kind of questions some design decisions. Um, and I'll explain why here in a second. So when a scheduled task is created, you have the, the opportunity to, you know, set some properties that allow it to to run with the highest privileges in Windows. Um, and what this will do is, so the previous ones were, they worked in the, the, the default UAC state, but they do not work in auto or always notify situations, which is why, um, you know, people are like, these are cool techniques, but we, in my company, we set it to always notify and we're totally safe and secure and none of this matters. Um, Always notify bypasses are a little trickier to find because those binaries that do not, they're that set to auto elevate when always notify is enabled, um, it will notify regardless. So that kind of kills the primitive of abusing those auto elevating binaries um, for elevation since the user is, is, you know, granted or provided a, an elevation prompt regardless. Scheduled task on the other hand, when they exist and they're set to run with the highest privileges, um, they execute with highest privileges without you know, el like alerting the user. So there is no prompt when, when a scheduled task um, that's running under the current user context or set to run as an interactive user um, with the highest privileges 
Um, it'll it'll elevate silently. Ugh. Okay. So what this does when the scheduled task is ran, ran is it creates a a random um, a random folder in uh, the user's local app data temp directory. Sketchy, right? Um, it then copies certain files there and then does some really dumb things. They fix this in Windows 10 RS2 15.0.3.1. So pretty, um, let's see. Actually, it was, that was the same exact build. So in one build, they, they fix, you know, two, two elevation primitives, more or less. Um, so again, that was fixed. So here's how this works is when you start that scheduled task, it's called disk cleanup. And what it does is it's designed to clean up your system, which it has to be elevated to do that, right? You just run it and it cleans files, all these temp files for you. If you proc them on it, you'll see that it's creating a file and see users mat, app data, local temp, random folder, and then, um, is that a DLL? Yeah, that, that's a DLL. So logprovider.dll. Um, so why are you copying files um, as a, as a, an elevated context to the user's lo local, you know, app data temp folder? Why not just run them out of the directory they exist in a protected spot, right? So, sure. We can then see that it actually copies dismhost.exe to that same folder, which we can write to because it's our local app temp folder, right? Um, so it's copying dismhost up. And then it is starting dismhost. So like I mentioned earlier, when a, a, an elevated process starts another process um, and it has as invoker set, it's going to inherit or it's going to start in that same context as the invoking process. So we now have this dismhost.exe running out of our, our temp directory kind of weird. Um, all of this is obviously with, um, you know, always notify set. And then we can see that it starts loading DLLs in that current directory. Um, so we can, if we can beat the mod load of that high integrity process, um, or dismhost.exe, um, we can monitor, or we, what, what, how this bypass actually works is that there's a WMI event subscription that monitors for that folder being created. And once it is created, it will copy the last DLL. So this took a little bit to figure out of like which DLL does it load last. Copies our malicious one up there with that same name and just lets it sit. By the time dismhost.exe goes, um, you know, it, it loads all these down and then it eventually loads our module. This is just an example. And see that we do our privileged file copy, and we are now high integrity. So environment variables are the same thing. Um, I won't spend too much time on them because I'm kind of running a little bit low on time. Uh, more or less, that there's a, the same scheduled task has it uses environment variables to determine where where this clean manager binary is going to run. It reads that environment variable from the current user environment hive. We can do that and say we are now creating an environment variable called um, winter give it the value we want. Um, so you can read more there. That's by another one by James Horshaw. Go ahead and skip that guy. So com hijacking, I'll post these videos afterwards um, as well. Uh, so com hijacking, um, this is kind of an interesting one. So without, you know, going on a rant of various com components and how they're registered, um, com servers are registered um, either, either in HKLM or HKCU, and the com servers are like in proc server 32, server local server 32, and server keys, and then that's either the DLL or the executable that, that represents the comm server. As you can imagine, um, certain binaries will load comm servers from the user hive, um, event viewer being one of them. So event viewer, um, like we, we talked about earlier, it auto elevate silently. And then this time it's actually looking in the user hive for this class ID of a comm server that it's expecting. Um, and the key's actually, you know, that, that random string and then the server, we just but the hijack primitive here is going to be to just write a value of our malicious DLL, um, which is going to be, you know, whatever malicious comp server we want. And then when we start that, it's going to, it's going to execute. So here, it's just a simple reg change. Um, we are saying this class ID or this comp server, when you resolve it, it's going to point to our comp server instead. We import it, we start event and it's going to load that for us. So this is the one I want to spend the most time on because all that's cool and nifty and there are all these little primitives you can abuse and uh, none of that matters. 
Um, bypass research for UAC at this point, in my, in my honest opinion, does not matter anymore. And the reason being is that, again, James, um, James, are you in here? There he is. Let's give a round of applause for James for all his awesome research. Yeah. So he did a three, a three part blog series on reading your way around UAC. And that kind of, this puts the nail in the coffin as far as elevation goes and, and how attackers can, can actually, you know, elevate their way up. So this was, he did a blog post and then, um, Fuzzy is sick implemented it or weaponized it in a PowerShell script. And um, so with this technique, you can forget finding all of those auto-elevating objects. You can f forget finding, you know, binaries that have um, auto-elevate set to true in their manifest. You can forget trying to find, um, you know, scheduled tasks that auto-elevate for you. You can forget all of that. Um, the way that this works is that when a high integrity, or a, a process with a high integrity security access token is started, um, the normal user, it's in the same logon session, so a normal user can actually access that token, that process and token. Um, so the way that this actually works, so it, it does get around um, always notify silently. Um, there weren't, there are like one or two always notify bypasses. One of them um, James put out for Windows 8.1 a few years ago. The other one was that disk cleanup one, and those are kind of really the only two that existed for a while. Um, this completely gets around any version of, of UAC that's set. Um, oh, I don't go back. So you identify, the way that this works is you identify a process that is, that is in a, the context that you would like, right? So one that's in a high integrity context. And since you are able to access or get a handle to that process, um, you can call open process through the, the Windows API, get a handle to that process, and then you can do um, open process token to actually open the token of that process. Once you have that, you can call duplicate token EX, which will duplicate that token for you. And then you can do some SID stuff and then, um, you know, lowering the, man, the, the token integrity level and then filtering the token so that you can actually apply it. And then you call duplicate token EX on that new lowered and filtered token. And now that you've got that, you call create process with logon W, which is another API, which allows you to start a process with that token that you have just stolen from, from that other process, right? So, that takes any process that has, um, you know, a token that is elevated. Um, you can steal it and then start your own process with that token. Um, so you don't need, you know, you need no additional, you know, registry rights, no file copies, none of that crap. Um, so from all of the other ones, we were changing registry. So it went from the dirty version, right? Dropping a DLL, copying that DLL to a protected directory, starting a process, super, you know, eh. That went to just making a registry change. So. A little safer, but not super cool. Um, you know, it's, it's maybe a little bit better. So we went from that, so, you know, dirty to still pretty dirty, um, to you don't need, you don't need to drop a file if you don't want to. Um, you, if you want, you can drop your payload or your code that's going to get executed on the file system. And you can, you can pass that to create process with logon W to start it up as elevated. Um, but you can do RedSurf32, PowerShell, WScript, whatever your heart desires. Um, without actually having to put, you know, that payload itself down. So this is the most OPSEC way of, of actually elevating without having to make any real, um, you know, OS changes. So this is what this looks like. So you can see that it's set to always notify. I did a port. Um, so we'll pause this guy here. So I actually ported it. So when Ruben did the, the original POC, it used add type. For those of you that aren't familiar with add type, um, it allows you to dynamically compile and load C sharp through PowerShell, um, as I do red team work um, in my day job, and so like dropping files down, like using add type kind of makes me cringe a little bit. Uh, but it was an incredible starting point, so I get a hat tip to Ruben for taking this incredibly crazy, amazing three-part series blog post that James put out and actually weaponizing it for us, right? So he did the, he did the dirty work, he did all of the heavy lifting. Um, all I did was did, I ported it to PS Reflect, so that was um, Matt Graber, Jared Atkinson, um, they, it's a framework that allows you to, to initialize and kind of define um, API structures and functions in memory using PowerShell. That way you don't have to compile that in C Sharp and then load it. You can do it all on memory. Ported that and then I added some looping. So previously, previously all you had to do is you had to give it a process ID. Um, the issue that I ran into there is operationally is I, running in an implant, I don't have a super great way, or I, don't, I didn't want to spend time developing a super great way to enumerate 
you know, what process do I want to use? So as a, as a, a medium integrity context, um, I, I need to identify a process I can actually use to steal a token that'll be useful for me. Um, I, I couldn't do that, so like, I need, I don't know what else to do here. So what I ended up doing was implementing a few other API calls, and what it will do is it will loop the process listing, it will enumerate the tokens that are applied to those processes, and if it finds one that has the high integrity level that we need, um, it will use that process ID. If it doesn't, um, it'll check to see, hey, am I Windows 7? Um, yes, you're kind of SLL. If you're not, it'll, it'll try to abuse some disk cleanup stuff. Um, we use this on an engagement where they, they had always notify set. Um, when users are logged into their machines and they have always notify set because their security department knows that UAC is the devil and like they have to have this up, um, users are going to elevate, right, at some point. Um, it's just the nature of it. Anything they do, they're going to get alerted for. Um, typically they'll click yes and, and they'll go on with their life. Windows 10 actually has some stuff that goes on in the background that actually, um, you know, elevates by itself for you. Um, so this will just loop the process listing. Um, you can you can set it, or you can you can change it so that it does a continuous loop, or you can just do a, a once over loop. Um, enumerate the process listing, find a, a target process, and it will actually steal the token from that process. And that's just what it looks like there. So. Again, um, you can find UAC token magic by by fuzzy sec. This is the original POC that uses add type. Um, James's, the link to, to James's posts are in the reference section of this post as well as two slides back, which you can go read the very, very low level details of how this actually works, because I probably did a terrible job at explaining it. Um, so all I did was I took that original concept, changed, you know, took Ruben's heavy lifting and, and implemented it in um, NPS Reflect. Makes it more safe to use. So you can find that here on my GitHub, invoke token duplication.ps1. Um, again, like I said, it just enumerates the process list, finds a target process, steals that, and then calls create process with log on W, which will give us code execution um, or the ability to start an arbitrary process with parameters in the, in the context of that new token for us. So mitigations. Like I said earlier, every environment that I've ever been in has at least a handful of users that are local administrators. Um, and it takes everything in me to not smack like the people on site when I see this, um, because this this shouldn't be a thing, right? Users don't need local admin rights, um, so just just don't do it. Um, so the mitigation here is to stop running as a local administrator. I can't say it enough. Um, I get a little more depressed every time that I go on an engagement, and I I have to actually elevate myself because these users are local admins. Um, so practice real least privilege. Um, you know, have separate user accounts. Um, over the shoulder elevation seems a little fundamentally broken, so James talked a little bit about it in his blog post. Um, so just practice, you know, decent least privilege. Don't just throw everybody, don't throw domain users in the local admin group for every host and call out a day. So just a special thanks to James, uh, Ruben, uh, so Fuzzy Sec, who, who did a lot of the heavy lifting for porting James's awesome work. Uh, Matt Graber for putting up with my dumb questions and helping me out with the race condition. And um, obviously H Firefox for maintaining a really good list or repository of these bypasses. Um, and then all the other people out there that have, you know, continued the research. So over the, probably the last year and a half, there's been a re, a, a re owned spark in UAC research. Um, so a lot of people have come out. Um, and they've gained some sort of interest in, in, in looking into this stuff. So while the token stuff is amazing, um, I encourage people to use UAC as a case study. Um, so if you're, if you're wanting to get into security research or you're looking at something to, to start out that's not super crazy, um, this is a good one as it's a pretty, it's a pretty easy technology to get around once you kind of have your rhythm. Um, so if you, if you need something easy to, to, to start on, UAC is a good one. Helps you learn Process Explorer, Procmon, how you know how Windows works to to a degree, how registry works, stuff like that. Um, so it's a really good starting point. Um, just because you know, obviously, the um, the POCs or the techniques for elevating um, are now kind of null due to the, the token stuff. Um, definitely go out and still explore some of these bypasses and find your own, um, just to get in that that mentality of think, 